Hello, my name is Phil Watt and this is my oral presentation for my master's thesis with the topic, why is test room development so hard in analytics or data focused projects? So we'll start off with a, an introduction into you know, why I decided to look at this, what the problem is as I see it. And we'll go into the discussion of my literature review uh, and then follow that with the methodology uh, where we'll explore really the choices that I made in the methodology and in terms of following the academic process. We'll get into the results then and finish up with uh, the discussion and the opportunities for further work. So why is test room development so hard to adopt within data and analytics projects? Well, TDD is an established best practice. Um, it's been around for a long time. I first came across it in 2005, um, but it's a lot older than that. And it promises reduced cycle time, improved developer productivity, and reduced production defects. But my observation is despite this promise, most data and analytics projects don't use it. Um, and this is based on my experience in analytics and data management, consulting and delivery uh, in 19 countries and five different continents uh, and working across hundreds of projects within the domain. So based on my own observations, I then validated that with some informal interviews with people that I know and trust in the space from my network. So these are analytics leaders, uh, two chief data officers, enterprise architects, heads of data engineering, and so on. So the literature review identified seven different challenges. The first five really stand on their own and can be uh, looked at separately, but the last two uh, are actually essentially the cumulative product of one or more of the previous five actually uh, combining to give some other problems. So software testing is different to analytics testing. Analytics focus on data and information, but software testing is focused on the program code. We get data volumes that drive a testing context much bigger with a, and with a large, uh, larger number of valid scenarios for analytics, which also makes things uh, more difficult. Data warehousing testing uh, often, uh, well, by design actually continues after production deployment. And this is because not only for regression testing, um, but what you can find is that new use cases have emerged that are valid. Uh, the data warehouse is there to respond to emerging requirements. Um, and so the testing context evolves uh, but the automated test you have may not. Uh, and then what is a pretty interesting, perhaps uh, almost controversial one, it provoked a lot of debate uh, amongst the people that I interviewed, uh, certainly that analytics can be by its nature non-deterministic. If you have a stochastic model, uh, that model, depending on how you seed it up front, may give you a slightly different result every single time you, you run it. Um, some people argue that that's not the case in most scenarios, and that's certainly true for things like linear regression, where you get the same result every time. But also, you don't really know what you're looking for at the beginning of these analytics use cases, and uh, that also means that you can't determine in a slightly different way what the answer is going to be. Combining those two means that uh, all those previous five means that the cost of TDD test automation test automation is higher. But also because of these and the pressure that people have to deliver, your project discipline may slip and you might not test everything that you need to automate all of the the tests. So moving on to the methodology, um, I guess technically we have a mixed methods approach here. Uh, the I really wanted to just focus on the formal interviews and the, the qualitative uh, method as, as we discussed earlier on. 
Um, and in order to support that, I created a, a, a brief impact, six page brief impact that I shared with the interviewees two weeks beforehand so that they could be briefed on what I was thinking on the sort of scope. But it also allowed the interviewees to have a more fluid conversation. It wasn't on rails, it allowed them to introduce their own uh, ideas or thoughts. Um, and while I was going through that in the early stages of the interviews, I realized that actually there was an opportunity with not a lot of effort to take the things that we discovered in the literature review and turn that into a short two question survey that I give to the interviewees, but also perhaps a, a broader audience. Um, and that really said, which are the challenges that we just discussed do you recognize? And secondly, how difficult did you find it was to overcome them? Uh, and then ended up with a synthesis and analysis, and, and we can go through that um, soon. So I wanted to start with the survey results before we look at the interview results. And that's really because the survey results, I think, give some interesting context for the interviews. Well, who res responded to the survey? Well, I invited a whole bunch of people from my network via email. It wasn't really uh, an open internet thing. Um, and uh, so I, I got 18 people to respond from a range of different sectors and a range of different roles. A lot of people from professional services, six, as we can see there, three from uh, telcos and media and three from public sector and a broad range across the rest. And the roles then were, uh, again, the majority were analytics managers, but we had data engineers, data scientists, um, enterprise architects and so on, and even a test consultant, which is um, really useful to hear. So what did they say? Well, uh, there was, as you can see from here, strong agreement that the challenges that were identified in the literature review are real um, and, and that they had certainly come across them. Um, you know, 14 each for uh, testing focus on data, not software, um, analytics, data volumes, causing a different context. And you can see a sort of gradual tailing off. This isn't ranked in terms of, as you can see, the, the number of people who acknowledge these challenges, but more in the same order in which they were presented to them and also earlier on in this, this slide, or in this pack rather. Uh, it's worth noting as well that I gave the uh, respondents the opportunity to add their own challenges that they come across. And, We'll have a look at that uh, in, in a second. Now, I think that this is quite interesting because these, for me, fall into two broad characters, uh, um, categories. The first two really are talking about the complexity that you have to deal with. And then the next three are really more about the people side of things. They're really more about um, education that coming into the domain, people don't have the right experience, potentially a attitude or aptitude. But the encouraging thing for me around this is that can be fixed. That can be uh, addressed through education and training. So then going down into a little bit more detail, um, how difficult were each of the, these challenges? Um, that non-deterministic thing that I highlighted earlier, it's quite interesting that that has a very broad range of answers. Some people saying it's not, applic not applicable or no difficulty at all. If they do recognize it, but also a you know, pretty even split across people having a lot of difficulty uh, or some difficulty and so on. Um, so I think these, th th this shows that some people, while well, all these problems are all actually real, in every one of these areas, someone has said there is no difficulty or a little difficulty, but easily got overcome. And again, that's, there's more calls for optimism that the patterns out there do exist to resolve some of these challenges. I'm moving on to the uh, interview results now. Uh, so we have, uh, again, a broad um, mix of people, data scientists, engineers, 
um, architects, program managers across five different industry sectors, most of them professional services, but that's relevant because they have experience across lots of different sectors. And uh, I think that one of the key ob uh, observations here is that advocates for TDD stress the importance of habit form, get into that habit early to drive the adoption and benefits that TDD is supposed to, to, to bring. I think the next thing is that uh, everyone that was interviewed, 14 of them, recognised the theoretical benefits of TDD in analytics. But eight of them, you know, a significant majority, said that that really was subject to the duration of the project. So short one-off projects probably wouldn't benefit, but longer term projects almost certainly will. The data scientists community had a little bit of uh, disagreement. One of them really didn't have strong opinions. Two of them focused on manual testing, and, and but one of them was a very, very passionate advocate for test room development. Um, interestingly, what they also added was that one of the best ways to look at that is to manage the test scope. Uh, and there was a lot of thoughts around that, which I'll articulate in more detail in the thesis. Um, and then finally, the, the interviewee commentary broadly uh, in line with the survey results that we, we went through earlier. Ten of those people that we interviewed, uh, ten, sorry, uh, ten people interviewed um, uh, in the survey results and four of the people that I interviewed did not respond, unfortunately. So, discussion and further work. Well... I think there's a lot of agreement that uh, TDD for analytics is different and more complex. Um, opinions do vary, but uh, there are some core reasons that, that we talked about earlier. Uh, so some support for the idea that TDD is best supplied for longer term projects. Shorter term probably should avoid that. Uh, and I thought that was interesting because that resonates with the heuristic model that Simonelli et al. came up with, uh, and I showed that in my literature review, which was focused on general software engineering projects. Uh, one of the key highlights for me is that so there was a, a minority of interviewees saying that test room development is always the right thing, but the success in doing that depends upon having strong uh, habits that are formed early in the uh, project life cycle and that you carefully design the scope of test room development so that you actually constrain what you have to build up up front. Uh, I do find that minority view compelling although I have, that may be because I was kind of hoping that would be the right thing before I started I need to really do some more thinking and um, analysis of, of why I find that compelling. So with further work, uh, I'd really love to spend a bit more time uh, improving the accuracy of the transcriptions. Um, I think I would then be able to do better text analytics across the whole uh, interview corpus and uh, make that a bit, uh, get some more interesting results potentially. Um, I think there's a, a large piece of work that could be done around better case studies for test automation, uh, asking, uh, you know, looking at where TDD is used extensively, where it's not used or some other test automation is used, where manual testing is used, uh, short, medium, long term, simple or complex. And we should also look at other factors that could drive productivity, improvements, frameworks, low code development tools, open source or proprietary tools. Uh, thanks so much for your time. Uh, these are the references that I've used in uh, in this uh, presentation. Um, thanks very much for your time.